have for me Romy Stach, and welcome to Derech Eretz, The Way of the World. In today's show, Rabbi Liebenberg moves the conversation to entrepreneurship. We meet media entrepreneur Kathy Kaler and catch up with Nadav Ostendriver, the youngest South African to make the Forbes Africa 30 under 30s list of most promising entrepreneurs. Imagination, creativity, risk-taking, and alertness to new opportunities are but a few of the core values to becoming an entrepreneur. Through the millennia, Judaism has encouraged study, education, literacy, and self-sufficiency as central pillars to living an authentic Jewish life. Rabbi Liebenberg elaborates on the entrepreneurial spirit of the biblical Abraham. When we think of the term entrepreneur, we automatically think of the 21st century. It's a new concept and it has to do with business. It certainly has nothing to do with the Bible or biblical characters. But I believe that the source of entrepreneurship, in fact, goes back to the book of Genesis and in particular to Abraham, the first of the patriarchs. Why is this so? Abraham was a complete iconoclast. He came up with a new idea and a new concept. And isn't that what the entrepreneur comes up with? Something new, a new business proposal. And the question is, how is he going to introduce this new concept to the world, to customers who perhaps don't know anything about this particular concept? Abraham was raised in a family that believed entirely in idols. There was no concept of a single God, of monotheism. And when Abraham was in his middle ages, he realized that there must be a creator of this world, one true God. And this was a truth that he didn't just want to keep for himself or for his family, but he wanted to spread it to the rest of the world. But how was this possible? And for this, he had to be an entrepreneur. First of all, he needed partners. Well, his first partner naturally was his wife, Sarah. Then he had another partner, his servant, Eliezer, his most trusted servant. And he had with him also his nephew that he raised as his own son, Lot. And together they were going to go out and teach monotheism. The problem was where they lived. The customer base wasn't particularly good. And therefore they had to move to a place where they would find more customers. And so Abraham begins a long trek from Mesopotamia to the land of Canaan, later the land of Israel, to find customers. But how is he going to teach this new concept to the world? How is he going to sell this vision? This is not something that people wanted. They didn't want to believe in a single God. They wanted to remain attached to his idols. And therefore, Abraham came up with an incredible business proposal. Try to give to people what they want and therefore slowly, slowly introduce to them in a non-threatening way the idea of a single God. And Abraham came up with a brilliant methodology. The way he was going to do it was with kindness. He was going to be kind. He was going to be outgoing. He was going to teach people slowly, slowly. And this is how he did it. The Talmud tells us that Abraham had an open home. He had an open door policy. He had a tent that is described as being open on all four sides. And wayfarers could come any time of the day. He also set up a orchard and an inn, a place where people could come for accommodation and for food. And he wouldn't charge him. It would be free of charge. They would come in and he would lay on for them an incredible meal. This the Bible describes when the three visitors who were in fact angels came to his house. He brought them water to have a shower. He brought them water to drink to, because they were so parched from their long journey. He brought them incredible food and he himself waited upon them and served them. And they ate and they ate and people would come to his inn and they would have an incredible meal. And afterwards they would say, we would like to offer our thanks to our host, to, to this person who's giving us all of this incredible food. And Abraham would say, don't thank me, thank the creator of the world. And they would say, the creator of the world? Who are you speaking about? And he would begin to teach them about God and about monotheism. He did it in a completely non-threatening way. And he used a business mind and a business concept. Let's try to bring people in, give them what they want. In this case, they wanted food, they wanted water, they wanted accommodation. And slowly we'll begin to teach them this new idea to such an extent that the Bible says that when he eventually moved from his home in Mesopotamia to the land of Canaan, he brought with him the souls that he had made in Haran. 
He made a soul. How does one make a soul? Only God can make a soul. No, the sages explained that he took those souls, those pagans, those idolaters, and he put them under the wings of God's protection. He taught them what it means to believe in a God. So entrepreneurship is not something new. It's not something that came in the 21st century. It's something that goes back to the beginnings of time, to the beginning of history, to an incredible iconoclast whose name was Abraham, who taught the world about monotheism. In 2008, media entrepreneur Kathy Kaler established Chai FM, the first global English-speaking Jewish talk radio station. Originally broadcasting only to a Johannesburg audience, the station has now created an international footprint through the live streaming of their shows. This is 101.9 Chai FM News. In 2005, I was driving with my mother and she said to me, Kathy, I had a dream last night and I feel compelled to tell you what it was about. She says, I never remember my dreams. And I said, well, tell me. She said, uh, I dreamt that I heard you on the radio and that was uh, what started it. Four days later, there was Pesach, uh, 2005. I didn't even know who to call went to the phone book. And at the back of the phone book are all those blue pages. And there was something called the Independent Communications Authority. And that was my first call. And I went from a background in marketing to not knowing anything about radio. Anyone who could teach me something about radio, I wanted to talk to them. Kathy approached me very many years ago and she said to me, you're working at the SABC. I want to do a radio program. Are you interested? I said, Kathy, I mean, that's an impossible feat. How are you going to set about doing it? She says, I want to do it and I am going to do it. And I did not in my wildest dreams ever think that she would succeed the way she has. And I must tell you that the effort and the time that she has put in to achieving what she has achieved is mind-boggling. You know, as they say, a ness, a miracle. It's important to have mentors and people who have done it before and people who can show you the way. Part of that process in terms of radio started with me when I was calling up John Burks and Stan Katz and I met with Izzy Kirsch who uh, looked across the table at me and said, how can I help you? And I said, teach me the model. I don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. And uh, he did. I went and I spent time with uh, the CEO of Prime Media, uh, Terry Falkvane, and I'll always be grateful for that because there are things that I have learned along the way from such people. I came into the studio about uh, two years ago now um, for an interview and Kathy phoned me after the interview. She actually wasn't on the show at that particular day and said to me, have you ever considered uh, being on radio? And I said, I'm ridiculous. It's not what I do. It's not what I'm capable of. And she said, you know what, I think you are. Come in and let's chat about it. And uh, we did that. And we've been working together for about two years now. It's just under two years. And it has been the most unbelievable, unbelievable amount of fun. And uh, you, you get to know a person under these circumstances because it's three hours that, although are a tremendous amount of fun, it is very, very, um, it can be stressful. You've got to be on top of your game and uh, you have to understand how the other person thinks in order to, to have a successful show. 11 minutes past four o'clock on the Chaya Drive. You with Sasha Star and we'll be back, right back. Today, you can call me what is termed an observant Jew. I wasn't always like that. There are times when I was as far from Judaism as a Jew can possibly get. I was looking for spirituality, and in Judaism we generally don't talk about spirituality and meditation and things like that. And that's what I was looking for. But when I found my Judaism, 
it became something that defines me. High FM is the Jewish community radio station, but it goes way beyond that. And uh, in fact, very often we test it out. If it's a biblical question, if it's a purely biblical question, that's when we get the sense of how many non-Jewish listeners are participating. And if it's a more traditional Jewish custom, um, one of the Jewish uh, customs, then we see much, many more Jews participating. Because Jews aren't allowed to proselytize, we're not allowed to go out and actively convert people. Why? Because God is everybody's God. Because of that, our teachings have largely remained internal. It went from teacher to pupil and from you know, father to child. It's not like that anymore. High FM, because of the range of programs that we do, all of a sudden you're getting insight into Jewish outlook which has never been secret, but there was just no reason to share it before. The same with religious teachings, our spiritual teachings, the Kabbalah, you know, the Mishnah, the Torah, the Tanakh, Jewish history. What we think is normal is actually not normal. And uh, it's, I think that it's very entertaining as well for people. I think what's special about live radio, instead of the complications, is that uh, it feels as though there's always someone with you. It's a very personal medium. You turn that uh, knob on in the car and all of a sudden there's someone with you in the car. You can't necessarily see them. But uh, people often tell me it feels as though I'm speaking directly to them. So it's a very personal medium. It's a very intimate medium. And uh, I think that radio, whilst the internet has become so prolific and, and people uh, tend to you know, send out videos on, on social media and things like that, I think that radio definitely has a place because it's far more immediate and a much better way to interact with one's listeners than television, for example. One of the points that motivated me to keep going, aside from this, dr this drive, was if I could let one person connect with God in the way that I had connected with God, because it's all internal. And uh, if, it, if Chai FM could change the life of one person, it would be worth doing. Fortunately, it's changed the life of many, many, many thousands of people. When I was interviewed uh, by Kathy Keller back in 2010, she said to me, what is it that you want to do? I said, I want to do production. She said to me, what if there is no production job? What are you going to do? Because of you limiting yourself, this is a community radio station, broaden your skills, learn everything that you can learn, and then you can see where you go. I said, okay. Well, if that's the case, let's look at, because of in the near future, when I'm 40, 45, I want to you know, run a station. And she says, it's a good one. Let's then start preparing you for that so that you meet your goals, you, you meet your targets as well. My Derek Eretz, if I close my eyes and I picture myself, I see a little person who's got one opportunity to do as much good in the world and have an impact in the world and there's certain mechanisms through which you can have a positive impact. Radio is one of them. And I think, that, I think that that's a very big part of it. And the bigger part of it is my relationship with God. Chai FM is a miracle story. I can tell you stories that will make your hair stand up, but you'll have to wait for the book. Latest sightings founded by Nadab Austin Driver at age 15 is an example of what a young entrepreneur can accomplish by using 21st century technology. Now 20 years old, Nadab is channeling his passion for wildlife, conservation and his love of the Kruger National Park by creating an online, real-time wildlife spotting community for visitors to our very own national park and other interested parties around the world. I moved to South Africa when I was eight years old. Uh, uh, my family and I lived in Israel. And uh, our first holiday we went on was to the game reserve. And I just fell in love, you know. Uh, we went for three days 
and uh, I was looking for a lion, leopard, cheetah, elephant, buffalo, like every single second. I was just, that's all I wanted to see. And um, the last sighting of that trip, we turned the corner and there was a pride of four lions just walking along the road. And it was at that moment that I just fell in love with it. I've been begging to go back ever since. He has kept a ledger since the age of eight until recently, he's now 20, of every predator sighting he has ever seen. Wild dog, lion, leopard, cheetah, the day, the time, the temperature, everything. This ledger is like a David Livingston diary. It is unbelievable. And so that's when he got hooked. And then we were gonna fast forward to when he was 15. We're driving around Kruger and it's quiet. Nobody's seeing anything. And of course, there's a tradition of asking cars to, when they're coming by, what have they seen? Have they seen anything? After the 10th car, my wife and I, Corrine, decided that's it, no more. We're just driving. That's when I thought, like, the Kruger Park is huge, you know? It's, um, it's, it's, it's bigger than some countries in the world. And right now, someone is, is, has to be seeing a leopard, or someone right now has to be seeing a lion. And like, I didn't know where it was. You know, so that's kind of what I imagine in my head. Why don't, why don't people share what they're seeing in real time so that other people in the area can go and get to see those animals. And also then people around the world can really learn about animals, see what's going on, follow the sightings and, and really hopefully get some incredible sightings that can reach a lot of people around the world and, and just, you know, great entertainment. When we came back to Johannesburg, it was school holidays and he went onto, the, onto Google YouTube and learned how and taught himself how to develop an iPhone app and a website and everything that he needed to know in order to uh, fulfill what he needed to find sightings. And uh, like that afternoon, I released the app onto the App Store. And so it's really amazing you know, using the, uh, YouTube or just the internet to learn how to do what you want to do. A couple of weeks later, he came out and he said, I've got my first sightings. And eventually, he managed to get 30,000 downloads to his app in one week. When I was eight years old, I, I started uh, uh, selling lemonade with one of my friends uh, overseas to, to basically to raise money to buy a game reserve. And so I think that's really where I started my entrepreneurial you know, endeavors from eight years old. Then at school, I used to help people fix their iPhones and, you know, and, and, and kind of had a small business there kind of thing. And so I've always been a bit of like a, you know, someone who tried to, to earn you know, and, and make businesses out of something that I really enjoyed doing. I mean, uh, the biggest thing about entrepreneurs is that they actually they do stuff. And that's a lot of the times what I do. You know, I, I'd rather try something and if, it, you know, if there's something wrong, I'll just change it later. You know, if I didn't think about it, I'll just change it later rather than get so scared about, no, once if it goes wrong and not do it at all. So I think that's, that's really definitely where, where kind of being an entrepreneur and having that personality really kicks in. So in the beginning, you know, later sightings was just about sightings and, uh, and really helping people see my animals, helping people around the world connect to wildlife through technology and through later sightings and our platform. And, uh, you know, we, we get a lot of amazing sightings. And uh, what happens is we use social media to, to post those sightings and reach people around the world to get them to then join the community. And what we found is we started getting a lot of amazing videos uh, that for me, YouTube was the only place to put them on. I mean, YouTube is the world-renowned place for videos. And so we took the best, the best of the best that we got, put it on YouTube, and we made these videos go super viral. Um, you know, our YouTube channel is one of the top five in Africa with the 380 million views, reaching 700,000 people every day. I remember when I first got here, uh, wildlife was not something I really followed. But through having conversations with park goers, avid park goers, I've, I've discovered something that I really didn't know about myself. And that is that I really, really, really have a good interest in wildlife. After we saw the potential of how big YouTube got, uh, YouTube actually asked us to join their partner program, whereby they put ads in front of our videos, or on top of our videos for us. And every time those ads get engaged with, uh, they'll pay us for that. And so, um, people who are sending their videos, we decided like it's not our videos, it's the community. The community is helping me build this up. So it's only fair that we that we share the revenue with them. And so we started our own latest sightings partner program. And whatever we get, we'll share that revenue with the contributor. And um, this has been very successful, thank goodness, with uh, 
people earning 200,000 Rand, 50,000 Rand, 10,000, you know, it's a, it really ranges of, uh, you know, of, of what they can earn. But um, it's a huge, it's a huge thing for, for anyone. I mean, uh, you know, it's life changing. And so that's really exciting to see that from the sightings, we actually are able to help our community who are, who are active in it. People trust him. People have tried to copy him and it just fails because the people are doing it for the wrong reasons. The Dove does it out of absolute um, passion for wildlife and uh, nothing more than that. Everything else is just a, um, a uh, just an added value to his passion and being humble and understanding the value that when he gets a video from a uh, on his partnership program he knows that he's got a responsibility to the person that's uploading it because there's a 60-40% ratio of sharing of revenue. So Nadav works and understands how to do it so that that person will get a good value for his, um, for his video. I've never worked for a 19 year old. So for me, a lady in business, you always expect your boss to be an older guy. Um, I think it's young, it's vibey, it's very, it just gives you a sense of, you know, the youngsters, you always say you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but you can because I've learned so much working with Sean, working with Nadav, Seema, she's a young updater as well. So they teach you a lot of things that you actually never thought that you knew, it's surprising, but Nadav is great, he's fabulous. I think he's, he's a, an amazing young man, entrepreneur, not just that, he engages with us. So um, on a level, we, it's almost like we're a family together um, and that's what makes us work so well. Forbes Africa, they released um, a 30 under 30 list for Africans and uh, I had the honor of being uh, one of the five South Africans um, you know, on this list and uh, and representing, you know, my community uh, of South Africa around the world uh, on on such an incredible list that people really look up to, and uh, it's a, it's an amazing feeling. And <clears throat> last month in November, um, Forbes held a summit for all the 30 under 30s around the world to just come together, interact, and listen to incredible world class speakers. But to meet the other entrepreneurs from around the world and seeing what they're doing and the, the weird but amazing companies that they're building up was really incredible. And, uh, and I think that's what Forbes and, and The List is doing, is just showing people around the world what people are doing and how anyone can do it. You know, uh, you don't have to be old, you don't have to be too young, it's, it, it's anyone can really do it. What they're deciding is one thing I always keep in mind, you know, is to try to bring light to South Africa. And like, for me, that is their Hillers. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's changing people to make them love this country and um, for me that's been an amazing thing because I hated it when people said no nah, I never want to come to South Africa or I never want to go to the game reserve it's a boring place you know stuff like that but having seen that we can actually change that and we have changed it in hundreds of thousands of people that you know are following us every day I think there's nothing better that that can be done for, for tourism in this country and, it, and it's huge you know it's something that I really love being a part of. Imagine a world where everyone's ideas are valued, where risks are taken by high potential dynamic leaders as they realize their dreams. Are you making your dream a reality? If so, we would love for you to join our conversation. So share your thoughts and stories on our Facebook page, Derek Eretz Connect. From me, Romy Stark and the Derek Eretz team, remember that if you change the conversation, you can change the world.